Next point is here the the ambiguous nature of some economic policies related to the environment. The book has a really interesting example of fertilizer subsidies. So this is exactly the same policy in two sets of countries, one in Indonesia and the other in Malawi and Nepal. But it turns out that fertilizer subsidies have very different effects in these two places. In Indonesia, the effect of the fertilizer subsidy is that farmers think, well, if we can easily get fertilizers, there's no need to engage in soil conservation. And so you get you, you, what you've observed is a lack of concern for soil conservation and also overuse of fertilizers, which then causes water pollution. So in other words, the fertilizer subsidies in, in, in Indonesia have resulted in environmental damage. On the other hand, the fertilizer subsidies in Malawi and Nepal have not. In Malawi and Nepal, you had farmers that were poorer than the Indonesian farmers. And the fertilizer subsidies in Malawi and Nepal enable these farmers to change their time horizon. Their time horizon used to be really short, just one growing season, because they were on the verge of starvation, and so they couldn't engage in long-term planning. Uh, there's no point in engaging in long-term planning, of course, if you're not going to live beyond the current growing season. And so there was no long-term planning. Uh, these uh, peasants didn't, didn't engage in long-term investments because they were so close to starvation. But now that you had fertilizer subsidies, that lifted them away from this very precarious line between surviving and starving. They were able to start thinking about the longer term and engaging in investments that would help, let's say, the soil for the longer term. And therefore, the fertilizer subsidies in Malawi and Nepal led to environmental improvements. So sometimes it's actually quite hard to figure out what the effect of a subsidy is going to be. And even even if it looks exactly the same on paper in two different places, the effects can in actuality be quite different. The next uh, point the book makes is concerns not only the developing world but also the developed world. Um, other policies it discusses, subsidies for pesticides and irrigation water. And these clearly are subsidies for agriculture, and when you subsidize agriculture, then you make it profitable, let's say, to cut down more of a uh, pristine rainforest in order to convert the land to agriculture. But what the, what the book uh, points out is something about the U.S. On page 315, the authors write here, in the United States, for example, subsidies on water for irrigated agriculture in arid western lands, for example, Utah, have led to misallocation and inefficient use of scarce water resources. Farmers pay less than 20% of the supply cost of the water they consume. Now, I may have mentioned over the course of the semester that one of the environmental problems I've been investigating is the misallocation of water in Utah, and that's connected with the proposal by the state government to build a Lake Powell pipeline to transport water from Lake Powell to southwestern Utah and also to build a Bear River project to put dams and reservoirs on the Bear River in northern Utah. The vast majority of water in Utah is used for agriculture and you can see from this quote by, remember, authors who are all from the UK that the inefficiency in the allocation of water in the western part of the United States is such an obvious example of economic inefficiency that even academic economists in the United Kingdom are aware of it. Indeed, the marginal cost of water for farmers in the western part of the U.S. is usually zero. They pay for water rights when they buy their farm, if they buy the farm, if they don't get it through inheritance, but they don't pay any marginal cost at all for water, and clearly if you're not paying any marginal cost for water, then you're going to be using too much of it. So, so developing 
countries in the developing world are not the only governments that have uh, subsidies for pesticides and irrigation water that can lead to inefficient use of these inputs and they can lead to environmental destruction. They certainly lead to, to an expansion of agriculture and that often goes hand in hand with environmental destruction. How about other policies? Uh, it's very common in the developing world to have food price ceilings. Now, um, food price ceilings depress agricultural incomes and as I write, thwart present's ability to do long-term planning because as we discussed in the case of Malawi and Nepal, if agricultural incomes are really low, then people don't engage in long-term planning because they might not be alive in the long term. And so that's not part of their concerns. Now, it's somewhat ironic that in countries that have a lot of peasants, a lot of people in agriculture, you tend to have food price ceilings, which of course depress agricultural incomes, and so you hurt the majority of the people who are in agriculture in order to benefit the minority who are in urban areas. Whereas in richer countries like the United States, you often essentially have food price floors that keep the price of food up in order to help farmers who in these countries like the U.S. constitute a very small minority of the population and hurt urban dwellers who constitute a majority of the population. In other words, in in, in both of these situations, you've got governments instituting either a price, a food price ceiling or a food price floor in a way that hurts the majority of the population because of the, because of the political power of the minority of the population, which again, it flips. The political power in developing countries rests in the minority that live in cities Governments often want city dwellers to be happy because if they're not, the city dwellers might revolt and overthrow the government, whereas revolts are harder to organize in rural areas. And in the developing world, uh, people in rural areas often have greater than proportional political power. In the United States, that's because of institutions like the U.S. Senate and the Electoral College, but other countries that have very different sorts of political re uh, rules also have maybe traditional, um, even um, even sentimental uh, attachments to agriculture that, that generate government policies which, are, which support the agricultural minority in these developed countries. I, I finally wanted to make one note which isn't in the book but forms a nice segue to the chapters in the beginning part of the book, which we're going to next. So I quote here Nicholas Georges Hugh Rogan. Let me introduce him to you. His name will come up several more times in, in the early chapters of the book, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Georges Hugh Rogan was born in Romania. He immigrated to the United States just before uh, World War II. Was uh, taught for a while at Harvard. He had he, his he earned his PhD I believe in the 1920s so he was already a professor before he he um, came to the U.S. Um, he taught for for many many years at Vanderbilt University and we'll be discussing him in several different contexts in the early part in the early chapters of the book here is just actually a rather brief remark of his that I wanted to point out the topic of this chapter is how to help people in the developing world. And Georgescu said in 1972 that he suggested at a conference to allow people to move freely from any country to any other country whatsoever. He felt that this was, would be much more effective than let's say policies like foreign aid or the kinds of development work that the UN does, the World Bank does, the IMF does. Uh, Georgescu suggested that you could get rid of the World Bank and, and the IMF, or he didn't suggest this, but he implied that you could get rid of multilateral organizations like the World Bank and the IMF, whose purpose is supposed to be to help developing countries, and, and simply instead just allow the free movement of people. By the way, the free movement of people is uh, not a new idea. In fact, not allowing free movement of people is a new idea. It's an idea that dates only to the 19th century. 
uh, before the 19th century, before the mid 19th century, it was simply understood that anybody could travel from any country to any other country. And Jurjewski's um, idea is that if you allowed this, then people who lived in poor countries would migrate to richer countries, and that over time you wouldn't have any more rich countries and poor countries anymore in the world. All the countries in the world would have roughly equal levels of income, and so you wouldn't have to worry about international income inequality anymore. This would take care of the problem. He admitted that his suggestion, which was made at a UN conference in 1972, was, uh, uh, well, perhaps I should, I should read his exact words here. It, it, it was not uh, welcomed with open arms. What's the, uh, what's the quote? Um, Jurjeskin writes, its reception was less than lukewarm. So I'm, here's the source of my citation. And so we will be discussing um, Georgescu in other contexts in the next few videos.